Hey everyone, I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Allison Morris and you're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. The ceasefire in the Middle East appears to be holding, but it's being tested early. Palestinians and Israeli police clashing outside a mosque in Jerusalem after Friday prayers. The White House is still optimistic the truce will hold. We have strong assurances from the relevant parties uh, that they are committed to the ceasefire. And obviously, this is something we will be watching extremely closely in the coming days. Secretary of State Tony Blinken is going to the Middle East in the coming days, what we know about his critical visit. And on Capitol Hill, the Senate could vote as early as next week on the January 6th commission. But will any Republicans get on board? Plus, Tim Cook takes the stand what Apple CEO is saying in court about the epic lawsuit that could change the iPhone and App Store forever. We start off with the ceasefire now in effect in the Middle East. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from Tel Aviv. So, Aaron, Israeli police and Palestinians got into a violent confrontation outside the Alaska mosque in Jerusalem just hours into the ceasefire. Take us through what happened. Yeah, that's right. According to Palestinian eyewitnesses, it unfolded after Friday prayers. Thousands of Palestinians gathered in the Al-Aqsa compound, also known to Jews as the Temple Mount, to celebrate uh, the Gaza ceasefire. There were all Palestinian factions present, including Hamas. The celebration was ongoing when, according to eyewitnesses, Israeli police arrived at the compound and began firing rubber bullets as well as stun grenades to disperse the crowds. Now, the Israeli police give a very different account of that situation. They say that they did not fire rubber bullets, but they did use non-lethal crowd control techniques. They say that they were arriving to disperse a riot and that Palestinians were throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails. Now, the situation there in Jerusalem is now calm. It de-escalated quickly, but it's nevertheless the kind of confrontation that can lead to broader violence, as we saw in the lead up to uh, the violence over Gaza. Uh, many trace that back to clashes at the Al-Aqsa compound or Temple Mount. Um, also, uh, some saying that this is just an illustration of the fact that the underlying dynamics of this conflict have not changed as a result of the ceasefire. Lindsay. Well, and Aaron, in some of your reporting there, you visited the hard-hit city of Ashkelon. What was the mood like there among Israelis? Well, they're, they're happy for the ceasefire. Ashkelon is uh, located just miles away from the Gaza border. It's one of the hardest hit Israeli towns. In fact, we visited one neighborhood where 20 rockets fell. Uh, we were at one house where a rocket in the hours leading up to the ceasefire came through their living room. Uh, the, the owner of the home managed to get to a shelter. Her son hid beneath a stairwell. Both of them miraculously survived. We were speaking to neighbors there and, and they say uh, they are um, thankful that this is over, but they do expect more violence in the future. Take a listen. I'm optimistic. Uh, people ask me, I have no idea if it will last an hour or two, a day or two, a week or two, a year or two, uh, but we all know that it will come back one day. I'm happy that we will sleep a uh, full night and we can go outside, like sitting like this, it's, it's not normal, but I don't know if it will last. Do you think the ceasefire is going to hold? Uh, who knows? Maybe a month, maybe two, maybe a half a year, maybe a year. But at some point, it's usually on and on. So as you heard there, Lindsay, just this underlying sense that, that, that this is far from over. Many saying that the ceasefire is just simply a Band-Aid on uh, the situation to just stop the current bloodshed. Of course, just saying sitting outside is rare for them. So, Aaron, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is thanking President Biden for his support. What else did the prime minister say today? Yeah, well, um, the Israeli prime minister, as well as other Israeli leaders, say that this was a big win for Israel, that they managed to hit Hamas and hit Hamas hard. And uh, in his remarks today, the Israeli prime minister thanking 
uh, President Biden for his support uh, leading up to the ceasefire. Take a listen. I want to thank President Joe Biden, a friend of many years, who stood by Israel throughout this conflict. He expressed clearly, unreservedly, America's support for Israel's right of self-defense. And I am also grateful to President Biden for offering to uh, help replenish our stocks of missile interceptors. That's so important to saving Israeli lives and coincidentally, Palestinian lives. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that the goal of the operation was to deter Hamas, although if you listen to Hamas leaders in the wake of the ceasefire, it seems as though they're emboldened rather than deterred. They, too, are claiming victory. They, too, are saying that they have shown their strength throughout that 11-day conflict. Lindsay. Well, and Aaron, I know you're no stranger to covering foreign affairs, and you have been um, probably to more countries than I can count on two hands. I hate to put you on the spot here, but what are you finding most surprising or revelatory right now about your reporting on the ground? Well, in speaking today with Israelis as well as speaking with Palestinians, what I find most remarkable is just this perception that this is sort of the new normal, that they've been dealing with this for years and years and years. If you remember, there was a number of Gaza uh, conflicts or violence has broken out, flared up 2008, 2012, 2014. So this wasn't surprising to either side. This is almost expected that, that, they, that this is the way life is. And there is some sort of acceptance that this is going to be the way it is for some time, unless some sort of dynamic changes on either side. But in the conversations I've been having, no one seems to be saying that that even seeing that as a remote possibility. So it really shows you what um, other countries who try to help mediate things, who try to help get this process back on the road to a two state solution uh, are up against it, it, it's sort of an acceptance on 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 either side that this is just the way things are and will continue to be. And not even cautious optimism, really just resignation. All right, Aaron Glockland, thank you so much. Now that a ceasefire is in effect, what happens next between Israel and Hamas? Joining me now is former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren. Ambassador, uh, it's so good to be with you. You told Andrea Mitchell yesterday that polls show most Israelis were against a ceasefire. That was before the announcement from the secretary cabinet about an agreement. How do you think Israelis are feeling today? Well, good to be with you, Lindsay. I think Israelis are feeling uh, rather uneasy. It was an interesting poll that came out today that showed that 81 percent of young Americans uh, approved of President Biden's handling of the, of the Gaza crisis and the achievement of a ceasefire, uh, ceasefire. Almost the same percentage of young Israelis opposed the ceasefire between 76 and 82 percent. And the feeling is that uh, we're just going to go back to where we were before, that uh, the ceasefire will enable Hamas to replenish its missile supplies, to rebuild its tunnel system. And whenever the Hamas feels like it in the future, it will once again open rocket fire on millions of Israelis. And we're, we're going to be viewing this film all over again. Um, so a very deep sense of unease in this country tonight. Well, President Biden is praising the ceasefire agreement. Let's listen to part of his remarks from last night. I believe the Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity, and democracy. My administration will continue our quiet and relentless diplomacy toward that end. Our White House team has been reporting on Biden's diplomacy behind the scenes, saying, quote, leaks to the media that Biden was striking a harsher tone privately than what his public posture suggested were part of the strategy. So, Ambassador, how do you think the Biden administration handled this conflict? I personally would give it very high marks, Lindsay. Um, the president uh, withstood pressure, including mountain pressure within his own party, uh, to come down very hard on Israel, uh, to pressure Israel, not just privately, but publicly. And he resisted it. He stood by Israel, um, defended our right to defend ourselves over the course of 11 days of very harsh uh, fighting. Um, and even what was conveyed to Israel was conveyed in a very uh, friendly and candid way and was not really leaked that much to the press. So I would give it very high marks for, uh, for very successful diplomacy at the end of the day. Well, Ambassador, there's a new story on NBCNews.com with the headline, Israel-Hamas tensions aren't new, but this level of pro-Palestinian support in the U.S. is. 
And we saw Senator Bernie Sanders tweeting last night, our job now is to support desperately needed humanitarian and reconstruction aid to Gaza's people and find a way to finally bring peace to the region. Do you see the U.S. now playing a role to regain stability and, and possibly peace between the Israeli and Palestinian people? Well, I don't. I think what was said earlier in your broadcast that the Biden administration needs to focus on other issues, the uh, relationship with the United States and China, the United States and Russia, of course, the domestic issues, unemployment, uh, political polarization, the still after effects of, of corona. Um, I think the administration looks at the immense efforts made by the Obama administration, even by the Bush administration earlier in this century to try to advance the peace process, and none of those efforts succeeded. Um, I don't think the administration wants to invest uh, at this time, especially since there really is no Palestinian leadership on the other side. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas uh, of the Palestinian Authority is now entering the 16th year of his four-year term. Uh, he won't hold elections. That was really the major reason for the outbreak of violence was Hamas frustration with the fact that it cannot run in elections, uh, and because, frankly, it would win if it did run in those elections. And also, there's a political morass in Israel itself. We may be entering our, our fifth election cycle in just over two years. Um, so right now, lacking effective leadership uh, on both sides. Uh, would tend to militate against any chance of moving ahead in the peace process. So I think logically the administration wants to sort of keep the lid on things. It wants to maintain the status quo and, yes, focus on humanitarian aid to Gaza. Um, at the same time, keep in mind, Gaza is not the West Bank. Gaza is run by a terrorist organization. Um, any aid given to Hamas will not be used uh, for the benefit of the people of Gaza. It will be used to buy more rockets and dig more tunnels. Ambassador Oren, it is a complicated and ongoing issue, and we certainly appreciate your time in helping us deconstruct some of it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. It's a busy day for foreign policy at the White House. President Biden is hosting South Korean President Moon Jae-in while still dealing with the fallout from the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. NBCnews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins me now. So, Shannon, it's good to see you. What can we expect from President Biden's meeting with the South Korean president today? Oh, a big for focus, of course, is going to be North Korea. You know, the Biden administration hasn't really outlined in great detail what their North Korea strategy is going to be like. Uh, they know they've kind of got to find some middle ground between this bear hug, photo op, handshake approach of the Trump administration. Um, and yet the Biden, uh, the uh, Obama administration's really more hands off, strategic patience, wait and see approach. They're trying to find some middle ground in there. You know, administration officials in talking ahead of this meeting said, you know, the administration's not looking or seeking for some grand peace bargain, like you heard the Trump administration talk about, that President Trump at the time would talk about tourists coming to North Korea and that sort of thing. They're not that ambitious. They see rather more incremental approaches and steps they can take. So that'll certainly be a focus, as well as trying to counter China's rise in the region. And of course, I think COVID uh, and COVID vaccines could come up because South Korea has been dealing with some uh, supply issues with the vaccine. They've only got about 5% of their vax of their population vaccinated. So you could also look uh, following this meeting to see if the U.S. makes any commitments about sending vaccine over to South Korea. Well, all eyes will also be on how the Biden administration handled the Israeli-Palestinian conflict over the last 11 days. And NBC News has some new reporting on that, detailing the president's, quote, quiet and relentless diplomacy, saying he was driven by a singular goal to end the violence in Gaza as soon as possible so he could train his focus back on his domestic agenda. President Biden faced pressure from within his own party to take a harder stance. So tell us more about what was happening behind the scenes. Right. Well, you know, they the White House repeatedly used this word quiet diplomacy. And we really only heard in detail from President Biden once about this conflict. And that was the remarks that he made yesterday that lasted just a few minutes. So much of this work took place behind the scenes. But we know more broadly, the administration sees the big issues out there in the country and the world to be uh, things like revamping our economy, climate change, China, like we were talking about a moment ago, even countering Russian aggression to some extent. The Middle East has not been high on the priority list. 
list. And you can see that uh, from who the president made his first phone calls to, who the first visitors have been. It has not been focused on the Middle East. We will see if that shifts after this. It obviously, this conflict certainly elevated that issue in the White House. We have the Secretary of State visiting the region um, in a few days. That was not a planned, scheduled trip. Um, and the president's also made commitments to helping rebuild uh, in Gaza. So we are seeing the shifting dynamic in the Middle East as how it's playing in the White House. But I think it's going to be still to be determined how high this stays on the White House's list of priorities or whether it goes sort of back to that side burner like it was before this conflict began. Yeah, because the front burner is the domestic agenda. White House officials are still working with Senate Republicans on an infrastructure deal. So where do those negotiations stand? I feel like we've been talking about infrastructure for weeks. What does it look like as we head into the weekend? So White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that the White House has given a counterproposal to Republicans after a conversation with them earlier this week that stands at about uh, $1.7 trillion. That is down from $2.25 trillion. Uh, so uh, still down about $500 billion, but that's still a big number. Here's what Psaki had to say a few hours ago about that. Our team, including Steve Reschetti, Louisa Terrell, Brian Deese, Secretary Raimondo, and Secretary Buttigieg, put forward a reasonable counteroffer uh, that reduces the size of the package from $2.25 trillion in additional investment to $1.7 trillion. And in our view, this is the act, uh, the art, I should say, of seeking common ground. So the White House isn't saying that this is a final offer. They are looking to continue this back and forth with Republicans. Now, how Republicans take this and whether they see this as a serious counterproposal or they just see the two sides as too far apart, uh, that's going to be determined in the days ahead. Because at this point, they certainly are very far apart. The uh, latest Republican proposal is around $600 billion and it excludes a lot of things the administration had said are key priorities of theirs. All right, we'll stay on top of it. Shannon, thanks so much. A vote on a bipartisan commission to investigate the January 6th Capitol riot could be the first order of business when the Senate returns from its week-long Memorial Day recess. But at this point, zero Republicans are willing to let this pass in the Senate. And me, News national political reporter correspondent Sahil Kapoor joins me now. So Sahil, good to see you. Some Republicans are considering the bill, 10 GOP senators would need to officially sign on for it to pass. But we saw 35 GOP House members vote in favor of it. So is that within the realm of possibility? Hey, Lindsay, it seemed within the realm of possibility after, uh, let's say, around the time the House was voting. There was a lot of Republican support for this. The main uh, one, one of the two authors of this bill was Republican John Katko, who uh, represents upstate New York and the House of Representatives, uh, negotiated this with Benny Thompson, who's the chairman of the Homeland Security uh, Committee in the House. But after Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, came out against this on Wednesday, we've seen kind of an exodus of Republicans moving either from uh, the undecided to uncertain column, and for the most part, undecided to no. There are many that say they're still reviewing it, they're still looking at it, but some of them are already moving to no, and a number of them have decided they're not going to support this. Right now, there's not a single Republican who has said they will vote for the House-passed version of this bill if it comes up in the Senate. So the road to 10 Republican senators is very, very steep, and it doesn't look likely at this point that the Senate will get there. So let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum then, from within the realm of possibility to could we be headed toward the first filibuster fight of President Biden's term? It sure looks like it. So far, there's not been a single piece of legislation that has died by filibuster in the Senate. In other words, that has a majority vote uh, in the Senate, but not a supermajority of 60 votes, and thus has been killed. This would be the first one. And in a way, this is the fight that progressives wanted, because progressives, uh, activists and senators who want to abolish the filibuster, want an issue that they can make their case and say the Senate is simply not working, uh, that the 60-vote threshold needs to go. It's hard to think of a, uh, an easier way for them to make that argument than if the Senate can't even pass a bipartisan bill to investigate the attack attack on the Capitol on January 6th in an attempt to uh, overturn the result of the election. That's an argument that I am told by sources we're going to hear a lot more of in the coming days and weeks if, in fact, the Senate does fail to get 60 votes to advance this bill, Lindsay. 
Well, Sahil, let's switch gears a little and talk police reform. President Biden's deadline for Congress to pass a bill is fast approaching. The issue of ending qualified immunity remains a sticking point in bipartisan negotiations. There's a group of Democrats. They're addressing that in a letter to House leadership today. What are they saying? Yeah, it's all but certain that Congress is not going to meet President Biden's deadline of May 25th, an informal deadline, of course, that was the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death. But it doesn't look like there's going to be a deal on time, let alone legislation in Congress at, at, um, you know, by that point. Now, what a, a group of House Democrats on the progressive end of the caucus are demanding is that the administration and negotiators not make too many concessions on the issue of qualified immunity. Here's a statement from those members, including Cory Bush, Ayanna Presley, Mondaire Jones, and a number of others. They say as negotiations continue, uh, know this, there can be no true justice uh, in America if we cannot save lives, just like there can be no true accountability in America if we do not eliminate qualified immunity. This is a major sticking point in the negotiations and has been for a while. The two sides have struggled to come up with a solution that satisfies what progressives want, but also uh, addresses Republican concerns that if uh, progressives get what they want, it would be very difficult for uh, police forces to hire, uh, recruit, and maintain officers. All right. Thank you so much, Sahil. Good to see you. The Associated Press releasing more body cam footage of the moments leading up to Ronald Green's death. Louisiana state troopers can be heard ordering Green, who is beaten and handcuffed, to lay face down on his belly. He tries to roll over in what the Associated Press describes as an attempt to breathe. During one moment, one of the officers seemingly admitting to using brutal force against him. The video was obtained and edited by the Associated Press two years after his death. And we want to warn you, it is disturbing. And I beat the ever out of him, choked him and everything else, trying to get him under control. And then all of a sudden, he just went limp. Yeah, I thought he was dead. NBC News has reached out to Louisiana State Police for comment on this latest footage. We have not yet heard from them on this latest release. However, they responded to video released earlier this week saying, quote, premature public release of investigative files and video evidence in this case is not authorized and undermines the investigative process and compromises the fair and impartial outcome. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson is joining me now from Monroe. So Priscilla, the Associated Press also obtained Green's autopsy report. What additional details are we learning? Uh, yeah, Lindsay, according to that report obtained by the Associated, Rep uh, Associated Press, Ronald Green had high levels of cocaine and alcohol in his system. It also showed that he had a uh, broken breastbone and also a torn aorta, although it is unclear whether that happened uh, in the process of that high-speed chase or if that happened uh, through the altercation with state troopers. And I want to read the exact language listed in that report according to the AP about the cause of death. It says, quote, a cocaine induced agitated delirium complicated by motor vehicle collision, physical struggle, inflicted head injury and restraint. Now, notably, the op the AP is reporting that that autopsy report did not specify a manner of death, whether it was considered a homicide, accidental, or undetermined. And we have reached out to the Louisiana State Police about this new footage and this autopsy report, and they have not responded to our request for comment. Lindsay? All right, Priscilla. Louisiana officials are doubling down on their decision to withhold the video from the public. What's the reasoning here, and how is the governor responding? Calls to do more. Yeah, Lindsay, officials here are saying that this is still an open investigation and it is premature to begin releasing uh, information like that video. And the governor is standing by them on that decision, even as activists are saying that he needs to do more and act in this situation, given that this was an incident that occurred with state police. Uh, but Governor John Bell Edwards has said that he is respecting what these law enforcement agencies who are investigating this case have asked as it relates to to this video. Take a listen to what he said late yesterday. Entities that are doing the investigation, U.S. Department of Justice and the district attorney, haven't yet completed the criminal investigation. They've renewed their request that the video not be made public, and, and that's why the state police hasn't done it. I fully expect that as soon as, as, soon as 
they are told by the um, those agencies uh, that they can release the video without jeopardizing the investigation, you will see everything there is to offer. Meanwhile, the family is continuing to call this a cover up and uh, say that Ronald Green was murdered. Lindsay. And Priscilla, it's important to remind folks it has been two years since this incident occurred. Where does the federal civil rights investigation currently stand? Uh, yeah, so the family filed a wrongful death suit, and shortly thereafter, that federal civil rights investigation was opened uh, late last year, in the fall of last year. And federal investigators say that that is still ongoing. Uh, and so we haven't really been giving, given any additional information on a possible timeline or when we could expect uh, that investigation to conclude or the state investigation, which, as you mentioned, has been going on for two years now. Lindsay? All right, Priscilla Thompson, thank you so much for your reporting. The body cam video of the last moments of Ronald Green's life is once again shining the spotlight on police reform. While the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act is stuck in the Senate, is the most effective change happening on the local level? NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster went to Charlotte, North Carolina to find out. George Floyd's murder sparked strong demands for change. Changes to police training, procedures, and the laws that govern the institution. There's things in history that you can go back to and say when the country was tired enough of it, then the change came about. And I don't think the people in America right now are to that point. They're getting there, maybe. But one year later, experts say police reform is sweeping through the country at an impressive pace. To see things that are occurring on this level, on a national level, and also taking place not only just at the local and state level, it, it's, it's amazing. And I'll be honest, it's about time. <laughs> the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department is just weeks away from beginning what it's calling a revolutionary retraining. It's putting the final touches on a new curriculum for the department's 2,300 sworn officers training that will emphasize customer service. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad experience with police officers. It might be a bad situation that they're in, but our encounter with them does not have to be a, a negative encounter. This emphasis on service shaped in the months after Floyd's death. As Congress debates federal legislation, lawmakers in nearly every state have introduced more than 3,000 policing-related bills. More than 30 have passed new police oversight and reform laws since May 2020. Common reforms include bans on chokeholds and neck restraints, updates to use of force and de-escalation policies, and new expanded body camera policies. Some jurisdictions have done more. Illinois' new law requires officers to provide an underlying offense when arresting a person for resisting arrest and ends cash bail by 2025. New Colorado legislation, considered the country's most far-reaching, allows officers to be sued for up to $25,000, ending the liability shield known as qualified immunity. Meanwhile, some states have reacted in the opposite direction. Georgia is now setting limits on cities and counties that try to slash police budgets. Police departments are also responding to the pressure. Charlotte is updating its early intervention system. The system uses an algorithm to analyze some 2,000 risk factors, flagging officers with the highest likelihood of having negative encounters with individuals. Our goal is to look at the totality of the officer and the totality of what they deal with and to recognize the pieces that we can affect change in. And if we create wellness and provide wellness and the opportunities for wellness, then our hope is the risk factors and liability go down on the other side. Community members, especially those impacted by police, say they want more. As someone who has lost her son mm -hmm. at the hands of police, when you look at the reforms that have been talked about so far, what do you think? That's progress. That's progress, but we still need more progress. You can't have officers that don't know how to engage the community. Even well-executed reform for them is just a bridge to a more dramatic restructuring. We've tried implicit bias training. We've tried uh, conflict resolution conflict resolution training. Before. We've tried all of these different things. But you cannot reform what's in somebody's heart in the system of law 
enforcement here is not just here, around the country. It's almost unreformable. It is time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. A high stakes courtroom battle is happening right now in California. Tech titan Apple versus Epic Games, the company behind Fortnite. Apple CEO Tim Cook taking the stand today in the antitrust trial. Let's bring in NBC News senior media reporter Dylan Byers. So, Dylan, Epic Games is suing Apple, accusing it of being a monopoly. What's behind their argument? Yeah, the argument basically gets down to what they say is a sort of stranglehold that Apple has on the app marketplace. And that between Apple and Google, you really have two firms that get to set the price uh, and that that price is somewhat arbitrary. It's a 30 percent fee. Uh, and that on top of taking that what they believe to be an exorbitant fee, that they are stifling competition, that they place too many strict rules on what apps can and cannot do, and that this is harmful to the consumer, harmful to the user experience. And so basically, you know, making this argument and, and, and taking this lawsuit in, uh, in California at a time when there's already so much uh, uh, scrutiny, antitrust scrutiny around big tech, Anyway, basically trying to force a conversation about whether or not Apple has too much power uh, over the app marketplace. All right. I got a two prong question for you. I mean, they're saying that this affects the user experience. But isn't it also that these companies are saying Apple is taking too much of my slice of the pie? And also, what are the implications here of whatever happens at the trial? Yeah, no, for you're, you're absolutely right. And this is, you know, some people have tried to pit this as a case of David versus Goliath with Epic being David. But <laughs> Uh, Epic would be a very wealthy David. Epic has done quite well for itself. And, and, and look, we do have to acknowledge that both Apple, Apple first, and then now Apple and Google have created a whole new marketplace, right? And, and their argument is, look, we need to be able to take some cut of that in order to fund our operations. And we also need to make sure that we're protecting the consumer at the same time. And, and that requires more than just creating a space where, where developers can do whatever they want. So you ask what's at stake here. What's really at stake here is whether or not this opens the door toward that antitrust scrutiny and basically lays the foundation by which you could make the argument that Apple is too powerful, that it takes too much, uh, too big of a slice of the pie in terms of instituting that 30% fee. And then you could begin to have ripple effects with other developers coming in. You could see Spotify coming in. You could see Match Group coming in. Other Apple critics basically saying, you know, if, if Epic gets more, if Epic gets its way, we want our way as well. And that could be that could really begin to eat away at, at the status quo and, and the power that Apple and Google have in this space. Well, the trial kicked off earlier this month, but today Apple CEO Tim Cook took the witness stand for the first time ever in a trial. Walk us through some of the major takeaways. Yeah, you know, look, by and large, what what happened today was that Tim Cook was able to effectively mount his defense, explain why Apple needs to take the fees that it does, and, and, and basically frame it in a way where he's really talking about what Apple is doing to protect the consumer. One thing that I thought was specifically interesting was they asked him, asked him if he could measure how profitable the app store is for Apple. And he said that that's not actually a number that they quantify. Uh, but, but you know, the argument here, if, if Epic and other Apple critics are able to demonstrate just how much money Apple is taking in, you could begin to have a conversation about how much of that money they actually need in order to put in the protections for consumers that they say they need to put into place and then begin to have a debate, I think, certainly in Washington over whether or not that 30 percent fee is too much. Uh, but, it, you know, other major takeaways, I didn't see anything here that suggests to me that Apple is particularly vulnerable here. But uh, we've still got a little while to go. So we're going to we'll have to see how that shakes out. So that leads me to my next question. When is the trial expected to wrap up? And just kind of pulling on something you just said, did it surprise you that Apple says it doesn't quantify how much it makes off of its app store? Yeah, well, for yes and no. The argument that effectively the way that the deals are structured and you think about just the sheer scope and scale of the app store and how much is going on there, I, I actually do believe that they might not have a specific exact figure on an annual basis, something they would report in their quarterly earnings reports, for instance. However, you think about Apple, you think about the level of thought 
and detail and discipline really that goes into every business decision they make. And, you know, when app, when, when Tim Cook says that he has a, a, an idea of what it is, my, I'd have to guess that that idea is more specific than he's letting on. Uh, this is the penultimate day of the case. The case will rest tomorrow. And then it just, it's a question of how long before we get a decision. I don't know about you, Dylan. I have an Excel spreadsheet. Every single cent coming in is accounted for in my budget. <laughs> then again, I'm not making Apple money, uh, but that's still no. surprising. <laughs> All right, Dylan, thanks so much. Thank you. So you got your vaccine and you're easing back into normal life. But how long does protection from the shot last and will you need a booster? Here's what Dr. Anthony Fauci said on CBS this morning. We are planning for the eventuality that we might need to boost people. We don't know whether we will have to do it and when we will have to do it. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, happy Friday to you. So Dr. Fauci says we don't know yet if we'll need a booster. The CEOs of Pfizer and Moderna tell Axios we might need them by September. Do we know how long vaccine protection lasts at this point? Yeah, great question. And good to see you, Lindsay. It's it's clear that they last at least six months, but that's just because that's the time frame with which the manufacturers have been following to see that you have immunity. We hope and know that it should last anywhere from nine to 12, hopefully a little longer, Lindsay. And I think the reason the CEOs are making this point is because we don't yet have the data to confirm when vaccine induced immunity starts to decrease. With other vaccines, most of us recall getting tetanus boosters, things like that. We do eventually need some sort of booster for other types of vaccines. And I think the real dilemma is how do we all go through this? But Lindsay, even more of a dilemma, these are vaccines the rest of the world needs. So, you know, how long will this immunity last and how much immunity do we need to overcome the threat of the virus? And those are still questions that need to be answered. Well, I know people have NBC News now on all the time, but how will we know if we need a booster aside from these companies putting new shots out? Yeah, I, I think that uh, as the companies are doing more research and as the NIH is still conducting more research, we will start to understand people like me who got vaccinated in December, when do my kind of antibody levels decrease? And then in the labs, they're going to see what level of antibodies, Lindsay, does it take to fight the strains that are around now? And I think that that's what, those two factors are important, Lindsay. What are the variants like at the point in time where we also think your immunity is low enough that you need a booster? I do not, if you're an American that got vaccinated in the last six months, do not get nervous. And, and I would also discourage people from running to their doctor and trying to get a lab test. Nine times out of 10, they're going to order the wrong test because it's confusing. Mm -hmm. And then if you do get the right test, it's hard to know what to do with those results because is a certain amount enough? We don't know. But I think that rest assured, the vaccine you have now work, and we hope that they'll work for at least 12 months. Well, right now, just over 38 percent of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated. So how do you feel right now about the pace that we're at? And, and do you think that the pace of vaccinations could impact whether we'll need a booster? Yeah, I think that. So I do think I feel good about the pace in the sense that uh, in many parts of the country and in some states, especially where they've had private and public sector incentives, they've been able to re-increase the number of vaccinations in the last couple of weeks, going from like, you know, half a million to a little bit more than that a day. So I feel like we could be on track to meet our vaccination goals. Lindsay, to your point, though, there are still parts of the country where 20 percent are vaccinated, at least 80 percent where the virus can go and infect people. And that could potentially be a new breeding ground for variants. So I do worry about that. And I hope I'm happy to see a lot of the pandemic behind us, but we can't declare victory yet. And I would just offer that people are still confused about when to wear a mask. If you're vaccinated, you do not need to wear a mask indoors. But if you're trying to go into a place that might be kind of crowded and you don't know if other people are vaccinated, wearing a mask is kind of a, a low harm thing to do, not because you're going to get sick, but you just want to make sure that nobody gets sick by this virus. Uh, Dr. Patel, we always learn from you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take care. Thank you. As things slowly get back to business as usual, many employers are facing a major hurdle. Their help wanted postings are going unanswered. 
So some states are starting to offer incentives to encourage people to get back to work, including Connecticut and New Hampshire, to the tune of a thousand bucks. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins me now from Greenwich, Connecticut. So, Kathy, a thousand bucks sounds pretty good. How will these back to work bonuses work? Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, it sounds pretty good, but there are some conditions. So here in Connecticut, you need to be considered long term unemployed. So essentially out of a job for eight to 12 weeks. And of course, you need to apply into this program and officially kicks off on Monday. And then once you secure a job, you need to hold on to that job for eight weeks at least. And then you can uh, potentially see that one thousand dollar check. And we heard from Governor Lamont earlier today, and he said that the feedback has been relatively positive. And essentially, this one thousand dollars is supposed to help people uh, give them a bit of a, a nudge to help for uh, transportation costs as well as child care as people consider going back into the workforce. Lindsay, but you spoke to some business owners about this cash incentive. What do they tell you? You know what? It really kind of depends on who you ask. You know, we are right in front of a a linen shop and she said that business has actually been booming in this community. Obviously, a lot of people uh, left the the city and came to the suburbs and everything was kind of um, as far as updating the home. That was kind of the thing over the past year. So her business has been actually very successful. And she says she's been doing the right thing. And her staff, they have been uh, employed the entire time. And she says, where's where's my bonus? But then obviously restaurant owners have been hit particularly hard. Here's what one owner told us. Take a listen. We ran ads for about seven weeks straight and uh, without any results. I mean, we had one result, but there was, there was, there was a no show. <laughs> so, uh, but it's been tough to find people, you know, to motivate people to come back to work. You know, partially some of them are a little, a little uneasy about the, the coronavirus still being, you know, uh, out there. Others don't want to get vaccinated for some reason or other. And others just uh, maybe are looking to take the summer off. And that was Rui Correa. And he was telling us that only time will tell if this bonus will actually pay off. But Lindsay, you probably see all the the cars behind me here in Greenwich. You know, it's starting to come back to life and a lot of people are more comfortable to to be outside, to dine inside and outside. And uh, he wants to be at full capacity, but he just doesn't have the staff right now to take on this extra workload. Yeah, I mean, you go here in New York, of course, Kathy, where you live and you see people out and enjoying themselves. People want to get back out, um, back to restaurants. This could be a, a key component. Thanks so much, Kathy. Oprah Winfrey is opening up in a rare and candid interview about the struggles of her life and reflecting on her faith and what she calls post-traumatic wisdom. She spoke exclusively with Today co-host Hoda Kotb ahead of her new mental health docuseries out this weekend. I wouldn't take anything Mm. for having been raised the way that I was. It is because I was sexually abused, raped, that I have such empathy for people who've experienced that. It is because I was raised poor and no running water and going to the well and getting whippings that I have such compassion for people who have experienced it. And so it has given me a broader understanding and a deeper appreciation for every little and big thing that I I now have. At 67 years old, with a lifetime of career and personal achievements under her belt, Oprah Winfrey is taking a closer look at her own story. Did you find as you were digging through all this that there were actually there was actually some grief inside you that had yet to be resolved, had yet to be healed? I didn't. But you're just asking the question makes me emotional. I don't know how (laughs) I did it. Uh, There's a beautiful poem called Yet Do I Marvel by County Cullen. (laughs) And yet do I marvel at my life. And what a marvelous life Oprah has led, despite all she had to overcome, from sexual assault to painful discipline she refers to as whippings. Young Oprah leaned on her faith to help her survive. You know, my grandmother, who was very harsh, but a lot like a lot of black parents during that era, Mm -hmm. the idea of hugging and loving on your child or even allowing the child to feel seen was just not a part of her life. But she did give me Jesus. She did give me a belief in something bigger than myself. So I'm grateful for, for that. I love how you said up till you were about 10, you thought Jesus was your daddy. I thought that was, I did. that was the best. 
Oprah recently reflected on her own childhood trauma in What Happened to You? This book made me think really differently about my own life. So I think that certainly all of the feelings of um, not fitting in or my disease to please or feeling like if I don't do what everybody wants me to do, I'm going to be rejected somehow. What I was afraid of in every instance, I'm afraid I'm going to get a whipping. I'm afraid mm-hmm. I'm going to get that whipping, even though I'm the boss lady, mm-hmm. even though I'm the one in charge, even though I'm the one who's running the business, I was still trying to process and figure that part of myself out. I've never had a clinical therapist. I've never gone to a therapist. I've never laid on anybody's couch. I don't know if that's even real. Do you lay on the couch? (laughs) (laughs) The Oprah Winfrey show was Oprah's form of therapy for 25 seasons. She helped others tell their stories and saw pieces of her own life within theirs. The first time I was able to admit that I had been sexually abused, raped, assaulted as a nine-year-old, happened on television. I was raped by a relative at the time. And it happened on television because a woman was sharing her story. And I thought, I swear until that moment, I was the only person who'd ever had that happen to me. So in the middle of her, in a show, sharing her story, I went, that happened to me. And so that's that's how I got my therapy. It's that same strength in numbers mentality that Oprah brings to the new Apple TV Plus docu-series, The Me You Can't See. Mental health matters, and that's the reality. Everyone has experienced a different version of the same thing. Harry's story, my story, Glenn Close's story, Gaga's story, all there to show you that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, how much money you have, that we're all in the spectrum with everybody else. In the series, Oprah reveals the impact of a childhood teacher. That's the only place I ever really felt loved. And it's the reason why, for so many years, I wanted to be a teacher, to be able to give to other kids what my teachers had given to me. That's why there are stories from people's names you know and people's names you don't know, but that are equally relatable. For people to get rid of that stigma of mental health, people have to speak out, and Prince Harry has been speaking out. Only after meeting Meg did you start the process of trying to figure it out. You hadn't tried it before, no. No. And I quickly established that if this relationship was, was gonna work, that I was gonna have to deal with my past. With his speaking out, Oprah, he's got gotten some criticism. I don't know whether it's for speaking out too much. He asked for privacy, and now people feel like they're seeing him everywhere. What are the critics not understanding about what's going on? You know, I ask for privacy, and I'm talking all the time. So I think being able to have a life that you are not intruded upon by photographers or people flying overhead or invading your life is what every person wants and deserves. That's what people are missing. Privacy doesn't mean silence. Also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? When they did their interview with you, reflecting on it, did they have any regrets about sitting down and talking about their lives? They have not shared any regrets with me. I understood what had happened to them, and I wanted the rest of the world to come away being able to answer the question, why did they leave? And I think by the time that interview was done, people understood. Why did they leave? Yeah. Asking and answering poignant questions over the course of her lifetime is what has defined Oprah Winfrey, her career, and now her own personal healing. But one thing she never questioned was God's plan for her life. How did you square the fact that you loved God so deeply and dearly, yet somehow these things kept bad things were just happening to you? How did you square those two? Oh, 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 I love this question, Hoda. There is a wonderful hymn that says, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, for my journey now, for my journey now. The journey, a culmination of what Oprah refers to as post-traumatic wisdom. One of the reasons I do consider myself um, 
wise at this point in my life is because I've not only paid attention to my life, been observant of what's happened to me, but I've been a student of other people's lives and paid attention to what has happened to them. Everybody <laughs> wants to be seen and they want to be heard and they want to know that their story matters. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Allison Morris, and you're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. The ceasefire in the Middle East is holding after 11 days of fighting between Israel and Hamas. And new NBC News reporting on what happened behind the scenes at the White House and President Biden's quiet diplomatic strategy. Plus. Having you here today is an important recognition of all that our nation has achieved together. President Biden welcoming South Korean President Moon Jae-in to a Presidential Medal of Freedom ceremony today. The two leaders meeting to talk foreign policy and North Korea and China. It brings indescribable sadness to know that the BBC's failures contributed significantly to her fear, paranoia and isolation that I remember from those final years with her. Prince William and Prince Harry slamming the BBC for its infamous interview of Princess Diana. And Prince Harry is revealing more to Oprah about his mental health and his struggle living as a royal after his mother's death. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.